Welcome to our Vision Sunday. This is the Sunday that we take at the beginning of the year to look back on where the Lord has led us, but to also look forward on what we believe, I believe, God is asking of us next. Before I get started, let me just take a moment to say a huge thank you to everyone who served again so passionately in 2023. You know, it's us serving together with a passion for Christ and his cause that makes a difference in the cities and the towns and the villages that he's placed us. So a big thank you to everyone who served in any way. We're really grateful for everything that you've done. 2023 was a very strong year for us where we covered a number of themes, went on journeys together as a church family, good journeys that brought changed lives, transformed thinking, had an impact on the communities that we're in. And our journey last year led us to a common place where we focused on prayer. We've just finished this series, House of Prayer. I really believe it was so important for us to stop for 10, 11 weeks and talk about how Jesus said, my house will be a house of prayer. My people need to be a praying people. I want to encourage you that as we move now into the theme and the focus that God's given us for 2024, we're not going to stop being a praying people. We're not going to stop talking about prayer. We're not going to stop desiring to be the people of prayer that God has called us to be. Yet the Lord has given me a theme and a focus for 2024, which again is a very strong one. And just like prayer, a theme that is very true to the heart of God. So our theme this year for 2024 is simply rooted, rooted. And our focus is discipleship, being the disciples that Jesus has invited us to be, called us to be, but also being the disciple makers that in his great commission to us, he asked us, to be and to take seriously. Discipleship, disciple making. This is the focus for Family Church in 2024. It's what we're looking to achieve. We want to call people out of a crowd-like experience with Jesus into something more intimate, more passionate, something that has an impact on their life in a greater way. Like the subject of prayer, Making disciples is something that the Lord actually asked us to focus on. Just as he said, you will be a house of prayer. We read in the verses that are termed the Great Commission, Jesus speaking to the church then, the early church, but also the church today, that we should have a focus on being disciple makers, helping people to experience a moment of conversion where they find Christ as Lord and Saviour, but then helping them to take the next steps into being the follower that he has called them to be. Let's remind ourselves of these verses today in Matthew 28, 19. Jesus said to the church then and to us today, therefore go, be a going people, make disciples of all nations. Notice it doesn't say make converts, though actually to be a disciple starts with the first step of being a convert. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey, to walk in obedience to everything I've commanded you. And then he says, surely as you go, I will be with you always, even to the very end of the age. This is what I've termed before a blueprint call. What do I mean by that? That when we're building church and concentrating on what church does, sometimes we can have initiatives and plans and strategies that are good, but we should never let them replace the ones that are essential. I believe when we read the Bible, the New Testament, the Gospels, Jesus lays out for us a very clear blueprint of what we the church should focus on. At the heart of that blueprint is reaching people, bringing people to salvation, 
But another important part of the blueprint of Jesus is this thing called disciple making, making disciples. We want to focus not on what's good, some of the things we do as church, but what is vital and what really matters in this moment we find ourselves in. We're living in a time, I believe, as you look at the chaos and the calamity of things happening in our cities and in our world, we're living in this time where we need to be helping people to be equipped, not just letting people be entertained. We don't want to settle for people coming to church, sitting, watching, not being transformed. We want to say, no, this is a moment for us to focus more than ever before on disciple making, helping people to get rooted in their knowing of God and their walking with the Lord. This is a time where it's vitally important that number one, people know him. We want to keep on being soul winners throughout this year of 2024. But also, we want to help and help those who do know him to deepen their relationship with him. We could put that this way. We want to help people this year to put their roots down deeper, to become rooted in their knowledge of God, in the things that they believe concerning what God has done for them in their life move from the layer that they may have known in their walk with God to deeper layers that God calls them to know and desires for them to know. So a good question would be, what is a disciple? What is discipleship? What do we mean when we say we want people to be disciples and not just converts? Simply put, we want people to move away from a crowd experience of witnessing things that God does to something more intimate where they're a follower and a learner. There's many definitions of what a disciple is, but I love the simplicity of these two thoughts. A disciple is a follower and a disciple is a learner, not an observer or an attendee, but somebody that desires God to transform their life, not just on Sunday morning, but throughout each and every day that a week can bring. It's to be a person <clears throat> who's taught, a person that desires to go deeper in their relationship with God. I love the way that the Amplified version picks up these thoughts concerning the Great Commission, where it says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. But then it says, help the people to learn of me. Help the people to believe in me and to obey my words. That's what we want to focus on this year, helping people to learn about him and to believe in him in a bigger way than they have before. When you look at the word disciple in its Greek definition, it simply means when it says, go make disciples, be a disciple, the Greek word that's used means to become a pupil, to become a scholar, to enroll as a scholar to be instructed, to be taught. So when we use the word disciple, make disciples, be a disciple, if we use the true meaning of the word, it means be a person who's a pupil, a learner, a scholar, somebody that's hungry to grow what they know about God. Be somebody that's hungry to be instructed and taught the things of God. So this year, we're gonna be calling people more than ever <clears throat> out of a crowd type experience with the Lord into something that's a bigger personal relationship with him. You know, when we look at salvation, it's amazing. There shouldn't be, but there's often two different packages that people can choose. There's number one, the package of conversion, that a person hears the gospel, responds to the gospel, and the Bible says correctly, that in responding to the gospel, they're saved. They're, they're set for heaven. They can have an assurance of everlasting life with Christ in this life, but the one to come. We would call that a moment of conversion. But then also we could consider something that's a different experience. When a person's converted, everything starts with faith in Jesus. But then a person says, I don't wanna just stay on the platform of conversion. 
I want to grow. I want to be a follower of this Jesus that's changed my life and saved me. I want to be a learner. I want to understand in this life everything that he's done for me. I want to experience a transformed life. I remember when I was thinking on these things, I felt the Lord, the Holy Spirit, speak to me one day and say to me something so simple, yet it was very profound, but really encapsulated the two different experiences of Christianity that people can know. I was spending time with the Lord and all of a sudden I felt the Lord say to me, the thief and the fisherman. Now in the book of Luke, you can read about the experience of the thief, the thief on the cross, the man that was crucified with Christ on the left and there was another thief on the right. But also in the book of Luke, you can read about the fisherman, Peter. And so I started to meditate on this, think about this, pray this through. And I felt the Holy Spirit prompt me and say, look at some of the parallels. I said, okay, <clears throat> let's look at some of the parallels. The thief and the fisherman. They were both around in the time of Jesus. They both encountered Jesus. They both experienced Jesus. They were both at the cross. One of them, the thief, was actually next to him. But actually, then we noticed something very profound and they both went to a cross. Now, this is the point I wanna make. They both encountered Jesus, they were converted. The thief at the cross in those last moments of his life said, remember me today when you're in paradise and we know that Jesus said to him, today you'll be there with me. He received salvation, but his life wasn't changed or transformed. He went to heaven and boy, when he opened his eyes, he must have felt like, I've often put it this way, a tortoise on a fence post. He must have opened his eyes and said, I don't know how I got here, but I love the view. He must have been so thankful for Jesus saving him in those last moments. Yet when we read about the fisherman, he also experienced salvation through encountering Christ. But then he went on to walk with Jesus. And there came a day, it's not recorded in the Bible, but in other writings, where apparently Peter was taken to a cross. And apparently it's recorded that when they went to crucify him, he said, don't crucify me the same way as my saviour. And he asked to be crucified upside down. That's quite profound, isn't it? What was he saying in that? One of the things that speaks to me from that moment is Peter was saying, turn me upside down because my life is a life that's been turned upside down by Jesus. How was his life turned upside down? In his moment of conversion, just like the thief on the cross? Absolutely, in that moment, he was born again. He became a new creation. He was justified by faith. But it was as he walked with Jesus, as he spent the rest of his life learning about Jesus, being a pupil, his life was transformed. You see, when Peter, the fisherman, went to heaven, he went with a transformed life. The thief went with a saved life. We want to encourage every person in family church to not buy into the conversion experience, even though, please believe me when I say that is absolutely vital and more important than nothing, but to be hungry for the experience of the fisherman, the road of the fisherman, where we spend the rest of our days on this earth learning and being pupils. You see, disciples are learners. That's what they are. So what I'm saying to you is what I'm saying to me today. This year, we're going to put the L plate back on our cars. Now, if you're from England, you know what I mean when I say that. When a person's learning to drive in England, they have to put this red letter L on their car. It's called an L plate. And that L plate says to other drivers around them, please be careful around me. I'm learning to drive. Now, often when young people, well, any person passes their test, they love to get uh, a photo of them tearing the L plate. And in tearing the L plate, they don't realize they're saying, we're not learning anymore. But anyone that's helped a teenager to drive knows the fact is, it's after they pass their test, they truly learn to drive. The difference is there's not a driving instructor next to them anymore that they're listening to. So when I look at my life, I think, wow, in salvation, I think sometimes we can take the L plates off. We can stop being the learners that he's called us to be. 
when actually the moment we stop learning is the moment we stop growing. So I want you to join me this year, join your pastors this year, as we deliberately put the L plate back on our lives and say, God, we want to be learners. We don't want to be crashing our life thinking we know how to drive. We want to be learners. We want to continue to learn of you. We want to be your followers and your disciples. It's also a time where I feel God's calling us back into the classroom. And again, when you're in a classroom, you're there to learn. Sadly, when I went to school, um, when I was young, I didn't go into school to learn. I went there for a social life. But if I was to rewind that moment, I would realize that they were providing me an opportunity to learn and the learning could radically have a great impact on my life. Sadly, when I went to school, we left school when we were 15 back in those days. I remember leaving school thinking I was cool, thinking I was the James Dean or the cool character. And I remember leaving school and walking out the gates. I remember the headmaster looking from a window and I walked out the gate smoking and I flicked a cigarette at him in this great act of rebellion as I left school at 15 to live the life I was going to live. It seems so cool in the moment. Now I look back and I think, what an idiot. What an idiot. I didn't make the most of the classroom. If I could go back now, I would be a better learner than what I was then. Now the good news is, there's a classroom that God provides for us called discipleship. We want to encourage ourselves and each other. Come on. Let's go into the classroom. Let's go to the classroom of Abraham. Let's go to the classroom of the Beatitudes. Let's sit, not as arrogant people that think we know everything, but as hungry learners ready to learn. This year, we're going to intentionally put our roots down deeper and we're going to become more grounded and uh, bigger in our understanding as we give time to say, God, we want to be disciples, we want to be learners, we want to be followers. In that moment, what we're actually doing is we're putting our roots down deeper and our lives will become stronger because we do. You see, we can't change the winds that are blowing around us at the moment, nationally, internationally, the economy, things that happen in a moment that you didn't expect. The winds are still going to blow. But what we can do is put our roots down deeper so that when the winds of life blow, we're not knocked over, we're not destroyed, but we remain standing strong like the, 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 the oaks of righteousness that we're referred to in the book of Isaiah. So being a disciple, being rooted, learning, being a pupil, hungry to know more about God. This is really God's desire for us. Here's a couple of verses that came to my mind when I was considering our focus and our theme for this year. Colossians 2 verses 6 to 7 says, So then, just as you received Jesus Christ as Lord, conversion, continue now to live your lives in him, discipleship. Can you see there, conversion? Just as you received Christ as Lord, conversion experience, continue now to follow him, live your lives in him, discipleship. And then it says, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanksgiving. I love that, overflowing with thankfulness. Also Ephesians 3, 17 speaks of us being rooted and grounded in love, knowing the full measurements of what he's given us. It speaks of us knowing the depth, the height, the width of what we've received in Christ. But you'll never know those things unless you commit to be a hungry learner, a pupil, a follower. So this year, we're gonna be emphasizing teaching and training more than we ever have before inviting people to step away from a crowd experience and come into a deeper understanding of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. Like I said before, there can sometimes be two different um, experiences of being a Christian. There can be the crowd experience 
and there can be the disciple experience. When you read in the Gospels, you see that Jesus constantly blessed and ministered the crowd. Yet he gave extra time. He explained things to his disciples. I don't want to be in the crowd experience of Jesus. I want to be in the disciple experience. It says also in the book of Mark that Jesus told parables to the crowd, but he explained the parables to his disciples. Yes, there's a bigger cost in being a disciple than being in a crowd experience of God. But my friends, there's also a greater reward. You see, the crowd got to watch miracles and the disciples got to handle them. I don't know about you, I wanna handle miracles, not just be sitting there watching them. Remember the feeding of the multitude with the loaves and the fish. It was the disciples that God allowed to handle the miracle of that moment when the crowd just got to eat the fish. I don't wanna be a fish eater. I wanna be involved in what God's doing next. Okay, as we close, what does this look like? <clears throat> a number of things we're gonna do this year to facilitate this focus and this vision. Number one, we're gonna be providing places of learning. Obviously, we've got our, our Bible school, The Forge. It'd be great to see a number of people sign up for that this year, for the coming year. But we're also gonna be providing courses and modules of learning so that there's gonna be different courses put on, soul winning, um, how to run your marriage, how to live your marriage, how to do relationship, different modules during the year covering a number of different subjects. We're also gonna be providing mentorship opportunities. Your pastors will tell you about this in a few moments. But we really wanna look at, okay, discipleship doesn't just happen in a classroom, in a module, um, in, in a teaching session. It also happens as people walk with people. And we really wanna celebrate the whole thought of mentorship, people mentoring each other, everybody having a mentor over them and every person mentoring someone that's walking with them. We wanna open up those thoughts in a bigger way. Number two, we wanna create a discipleship culture in the church that celebrates more than ever people learning about God. We want to talk about this from the stage. We want to talk about this in our, in our connect groups. We want to be talking about celebrating being learners and followers, not just converts throughout family church. And number three, there's going to be a Sunday focus on learning. Being deliberate to systematically unpack some key doctrines, another word for doctrine is teaching, that every believer should understand. There's certain um, teachings or doctrines or ologies that every believer, not just those who think they're clever or are good at academics, every believer needs to understand some core doctrines. Again, we could call those ologies regarding um, our faith in Christ and what we understand salvation to be. Over the next 11 months specifically, we're gonna be looking at things like Christology, and that's where we look at the person and the nature and the work of Jesus. We're gonna be looking at soteriology, and that basically is the doctrine or the study of salvation, knowing what happened when we got saved. We're gonna be looking at pneumatology, which is the study of the Holy Spirit, his indwelling in our lives, but also what the Holy Spirit does in us and through us. And then we're also gonna be looking to cover the thought of eschatology. Don't be put off by these words, they just all end with ology. But they're teachings, they're fundamental core teachings. Now eschatology is an exciting one, it's the study of last things or end times. Don't you have questions? What does the book of Revelations mean? What is it saying? What is the return of Christ gonna look like? Where does rapture fit into this? When is the second coming of Christ? All of these questions that we can have in our lives, we're gonna take time this year, not in a boring way, but in a powerful way, to talk about Jesus, to talk about what salvation is, to talk about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and to talk about end times, last days. 
Why are we doing this? Number one, because we believe, as we established last year, this is a Kairos time. This is a moment when God is on the move and we don't want anyone in family church to miss what he's doing. Number two, we know that it's promised us in the word of God that Jesus Christ will return again. That's not a fairy tale, that's a reality. There's a time and a moment, a Kairos moment in the heart of the father where he's gonna to say to his son, now, and Jesus Christ will come without warning and he'll come to collect those who belong to him, those who have placed their faith in him. If we're gonna take that seriously, we've got to understand there's two things that we need to be passionate about more than ever, because our salvation draws closer now than when we first believed. Number one, if Jesus Christ is coming soon, we've got to be committed to soul winning. We've got to get as many people in the ark of his salvation before the day comes when he appears in the sky. And number two, I feel a responsibility as the senior leader of Family Church. Me and Gina as the senior leaders of Family Church, the lead pastors feel a great responsibility, not just to get the unsaved into the boat, but to get the bride, that's you, ready for collection. There is a day in the Father's calendar where the bridegroom is coming for the bride. Family Church, we wanna focus on discipleship because we want you, the bride, us, the bride, to be ready for his return. So we welcome you to join in with all of the things we're gonna be doing this year. I hope that this excites you, it excites me. I'm gonna hand over to your pastors now to unpack this a little bit further. On behalf of me and Gina, we just wanna say again, we love you so much, we're so thankful for all of you who give your lives for the cause of the King and his kingdom. We believe that this year, and we're praying that this year will be an amazing one for each and every one of you. God bless. You.